Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, nice warm welcome, kind of in celebration of these nice warm temperatures we've had the last couple of days. Um, it's a little bit of a relief, I will say. Uh, I'm going to start us out this evening um, just with a couple of announcements. My name is Susan O'Handley and I'm a co-president for the Delaware at Sego Audubon Society. Uh, I'm joined tonight uh, with moderators from the Audubon chapter, uh, fellow president Becky Gretton and our treasurer Charlie Scheim that will help with moderating just um, to keep an eye on things and look for questions that might come in um, during the program. A uh, couple of announcements, I'm going to keep it as brief as I can because um, many of you probably saw our slideshow. Uh, the optics raffle is kind of wrapping up uh, just since the last since the last program on Tuesday. Um, we've sold another 20 some odd tickets. So we're down to remaining 18 or 20 that are left. Uh, four great prizes, including binoculars and a spotting scope and tripod prize as well this year. Everything is available at the DOAS website, doas.us. Um, this month, we also are kicking off our native plant sale fundraiser. This is a first time event for us, and we're hoping to put funds back into our climate action project fund uh, through that fundraiser. And we had a great program overview uh, from the town of Delhi that highlighted a community project that they did last year with native plants, and we're hoping that others might be inspired to um, take that on in their areas. There's resources online, the webinar is online if you missed it. Uh, upcoming next month, our Friday, April 15th program is Landscaping with na Native Plants uh, for the homeowner. It's a kind of a how-to and why guide, and that's with Dr. Lisa Tessier, and that's April 15th on Zoom, registration is required. Um, the following month, Friday, May 20th, is Breeding Bird Atlasing with Charlie Shine. Uh, nice overview of the Breeding Bird Atlas and kind of how to do it and where we are currently. Uh, well, that's also on Zoom and you can pre-register for that online as well. Couple of bird walks coming up in May. Susquehanna Greenway Bird Walk is on May 7th. The May 14th is the DOAS Big Day Bird Count, and um, both those are through Charlie Scheim. So his contact information is on the website for anybody to reach out if they would like to participate in those two events. Um, we also have a yeah, uh, wildflower walk at Gilbert Lake State Park. This is an addition to our calendar. So uh, that's going to be on, I believe, Wednesday, May 18th. Uh, details are coming soon on the website and they'll be in the Kingfisher. So I think that's where I'll stop for this evening. And I will turn it over to Becky for this evening's program to introduce our speaker, which we're all very excited to hear from. Becky? Thank, oh. you, Su Thank you, Susan. Our speaker, Kyle Dudgeon, is a 24-year-old nature photographer and writer based in Bozeman, Montana. A New York native and graduate of SUNY Oneonta, photography has led Kyle's journeys across North America, capturing wild moments in incredible places. With his photographs and written word, Kyle strives to share the power and emotion that the natural word possesses, world possesses, in hopes of encouraging conservation of species and environments at risk. Welcome, Kyle. Becky or Thank Kyle, you. before you start, um, I just wanna let people know about the question answer procedure, which I forgot. Um, we're gonna do things a little bit differently tonight um, because Kyle kind of likes to see everybody's faces, um, <laughs> especially for the question answer answer part. Um, one of the challenges of doing programs on Zoom is that you really don't see reactions from people because um, the audience is separated out from the presentation. So what we're going to do is if you have questions, 
still use the Q&A button just so that we have a record of your question. And if you miss it or forget it, that we can prompt you and remind you. But after the presentation is finished, we're going to move everybody over into panelists so that we can all see each other. And then you can ask questions directly and it can be a little bit more interactive for that part of, uh, of the program for the question and answer period. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Um, if you've been to past presentations, we typically haven't done that, but um, we want to um, really have that Q&A part interactive. So sorry for interjecting and over to Kyle. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Thank you both for the introduction. Let's see if my screen share works here. So I actually do have a physical audience today. I have a mule deer about 15 feet out my window and also some birds flying around. So this is kind of cool. <clears throat> so yes, I'm Kyle Dudgeon. Um, Becky, thank you for the introduction. I uh, am a graduate of SUNY Onianza in the Environmental Sustainability and Geography Department. And I've since moved my life out to Montana, the fourth largest state, right in the heart of the Rockies. So before we get going on our Yellowstone presentation today, I just want to update everybody. Um, if you weren't on the Owl Story uh, Zoom lecture last year, my apologies, this might be confusing, but to everybody who was and everybody who donated to this incredible project that we've been working on, um, thank you so much. This is the official cover art. So we're getting very close. My buddy Jake and I have worked um, you know, the better part of this entire year, not just filming, but um, editing and post-processing and, and interviewing people and narrating it myself. So we are super excited to get the ball rolling. That film should be out online this fall, and we're hoping to have it featured in a few different film festivals as well. So very exciting. All right. So for those of you who haven't spoken to me this year, I updated my, my life a little bit. Um, I'm now an interpretive guide in Yellowstone National Park. Um, my job is to pick my wonderful clients up in the morning, people I've never met before, load them up into a vehicle and take them out into Yellowstone um, and teach them about the wildlife, the ecology, and all that good stuff. Coincidentally, I am about a thousand yards from Yellowstone right now in the small town of Gardner, Montana, uh, which is where our company is based. My permanent address is in Bozeman. So I'm kind of living in two places right now, but this is a cool photo of me in my office, um, actually having my morning coffee in my office, which is not like your typical cubicle. It's actually 2.2 million acres um, with about 200 and 250 miles of roads run through it. So it's, it's quite a large place to call um, a workspace. This is the view from Gardner in the morning, um, being that it's you know the tail end of winter here. We're starting this presentation in winter. And I just want to say happy 150th birthday to Yellowstone. I don't think anybody was here when it was founded in 1872, but if you were, I'm jealous. <clears throat> so just a rundown on my job. Um, this is me and a couple of my wonderful clients. That's Blake in the front and Andy in the middle, myself in the back. Um, again, being that it's winter, we're gonna start kind of sequentially here in, in the winter and move on to the spring and summer. But this is kind of what I get to do on a daily basis. Let me get my little, actually, I don't know where that is. Where is it, where is it, where is it? I'll move the mouse out of the way. Uh, this is what I get to do on a daily basis. I, I get to meet awesome people. We get to do fun things like snowshoe or walk along the roads or in some winters like this one, we don't even have to snowshoe. We can just uh, walk ourselves um, out into Yellowstone to view wildlife. So we have high powered spotting scopes. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with those. Um, and also, you know, when I first came to this park, I had a lot of little nooks and crannies that I discovered on my own. And the picture on the right here is one of them. It's, it's, back behind this little canyon in Pebble Creek. So what I get to do is not only, you know, take people to spots to see wildlife, but also just show them Yellowstone for what it is and how I got to experience Yellowstone in the first place. We're very fortunate here at Yellowstone Wild, which is our company. Um, you know, the world is kind of ours, the guides. 
the second we pick our clients up and head into the park in the morning. And that's a really special thing. So we're gonna, I love maps. Absolutely love maps in these presentations. They, they eat up a couple slides. So here we go. Um, this is the United States of America. Northwest Wyoming here is right where Yellowstone is gonna be located. So quick zoom into Yellowstone. Um, as I mentioned, 2.2 million acres, a whole bunch of roads running through it, but there's still a lot of open space that you can really only get to on foot, which is incredible. So in the winter time, um, the park interior roads close to vehicle travel. There are ways to get down there in snow coaches um, and snowmobiles and other forms of over snow travel if you're lucky. Um, but fortunately, because of these little towns in Cook City and Silvergate in the northeast corner of the park, just outside the northeast corner, this entire northern range road stays open. Um, I just want to be sure, can somebody confirm or deny if my mouse is visible to people? Because I'm going to be using that a lot today. Your mouse is visible. Perfect. All right. Mike, Thank you. <laughs> Kyle, can so, I yeah. suggest um, that you stop your, your personal video just to save a little bit of bandwidth? Yeah, absolutely. Let me see. There you go. All right. Stop my video. Good. Um, okay, so back to Yellowstone. So this northern range, the northern, really the whole northern third of the park, uh, we have access to in the winter time. Thank, thanks to these or to this road right here from Mammoth uh, at the the north entrance all the way out to uh, Silvergate and Cook City. So what's cool about the northern range? It differs from the rest of the park in that we have a lot more open space. And the geology is really to thank for that. And without getting too far into the geology, um, there was a lot of volcanic activity several million years ago that left us with this really rich and organic um, bedrock that allows these big open grasslands to form. If you look at a habitat map of Yellowstone, the park's interior is predominantly lodgepole pine forest. So while it's super fun and you can get down and get on some high mountain passes, um, and also out to Yellowstone Lake, which is a huge attraction, um, you're really not seeing much besides trees along the roads. That's not the case for the Northern Range. This is a photo of one of my clients enjoying his 60th birthday from that big open hell roaring base on the Northern Range. Another photo here overlooking Blacktail Plateau. You can see, I like to say this, the sense of space you get in Yellowstone is, is really unlike anywhere else um, in the world that I've experienced. You know. There are pretty much, you know, an infinite number of spots in the park on the northern range where you can look and see for five or 10 or more miles. And that's really special and also really beneficial for finding wildlife. I love this photo. I took this a couple months ago. This is your fresh wolf tracks actually on a road uh, with my boot print down here. Pretty cool. We will definitely be getting into wolves. <clears throat> So one of the main attractions on the Northern Range is Lamar Valley. Some of you may have heard that term before. Um, Lamar Valley is what I like to call Yellowstone's Mecca for wildlife. Uh, we have about two thirds of our entire bison herd up in Lamar Valley. A lot of our elk using the high ridges and slopes as well as the valley in the summertime um, and the shoulder seasons as well. And also in the winter, um, for some reason it becomes the coldest place on the northern range so this particular morning we had negative 23 that's why the trees are all covered in hoarfrost pretty cool but yeah being that it's some of the lowest elevation in the park um, as i mentioned before one of the richest grasslands um, we have a lot of wildlife here so it ends up being you know our number one destination a lot of times um, going into the park in the morning So we have to start off with the American bison. My, uh, my goal for this presentation is to kind of walk you guys through, um, you know, what we can kind of expect to see on a daily basis in the park um, and also give a little bit of a background about those animals and um, also some birds. <clears throat> so, yeah, these are uh, two bull American bison on that same really cold minus 23 morning. Um, so their coats just get completely covered in frost. 
So this is an animal that's really well equipped for the winter. As you can see, these, I'm only showing bulls right now. So bulls are a little bit structurally different than the females, the cows, um, but they have these big old heads and effectively, or I'm sorry, essentially what that head is for is clearing snow and acting as a big snow plow. So this big hump on a bison's shoulders is all muscle. And what that allows them to do is swing their head back and forth and clear a lot of the snow out of the way. And oftentimes it leaves them looking like this, which is really cool. What has become one of my favorite images taken this winter um, is a bull without any snow on his face. We've had a, a pretty low snow year, um, which is not what we needed after a pretty dry summer, hot and dry summer. Um, but I had a I had a photo client along a couple weeks ago and I kind of I taught her how to take a photo with not a lot of snow and make it look like a lot of snow. So it's cool to get a white background there. So this is an example of what happens when the bison start moving around when it starts snowing. And while they don't often leave the park, some of them make it out to Gardner. Um, they're always moving around inside of the park and using the roads a lot of times to do that because obviously asphalt is a lot easier to walk on than, you know, sometimes three, four or five feet of snow. <clears throat> so yeah, bison are a magnificent animal week to see every single day uh, that we go inside the park. Another one of these large megafauna species, obviously the moose. This is a bull moose in a snowstorm. This is another animal that we really hope that we can go and see another <laughs> example here of a, a moose using the road. Um, our moose population in Yellowstone is interesting. So back in 1988, we had 52% of Yellowstone burn in, in wildfire, and we lost a lot of our old growth forest during that fire. Um, moose require old growth forests for their habitat because in the wintertime especially, um, they eat a tree called the subalpine fir. They eat the needles of the low-hanging branches. Um, and a lot of those subalpine fir were lost in those fires. So what did the moose do? They moved down to Jackson, Wyoming. And if you've ever been down to Grand Teton or the Jackson Valley, you can't go even a day without seeing several moose any, any time of the year, really. Here's a good example of the other main food item that moose are eating in the winter. That's going to be willow. Munching away. I just took that video last weekend. These are very recent images and videos today. It's just pretty fun. <clears throat> Moving on, we got the younger cousin or smaller cousin of the wolf. There's actually two. This is going to be your coyote or coyote, which I started saying after about six months in Montana because. Coyote is not what people call them out here. <laughs> it's coyote. Um, good example here. When the snow gets deep, uh, a lot of our, our uh, predator species, especially in coyotes and coyotes and foxes, uh, they listen for prey underneath the snow. And when they finally gauge where that vole might be, um, it's a pretty cool thing to see them launch out and eventually hit the ground. I don't have the other photo in this sequence, unfortunately. Here's a fox, which this is an animal that's been really hard to come by this year. This photo was taken last winter, um, nestled in, actually sleeping, because here's a photo of this animal with the eyes open. Um, so with the drought that we had over the summer, and really over, we're stuck in a multi-year drought here, um, a lot of the meadow habitat that these foxes require for their food source in, in those metal bowls, um, they, it wasn't getting the amount of moisture that it, it really needed. So voles require a lot of green grass. It's what they're eating um, throughout the year. When they don't get it, when it's hot and dry, we get these cyclical population crashes and that'll affect your um, predator species all the way up to your, your birds of prey too. Your um, great gray owl is a great example of a bird that actually goes through cyclical breeding periods based on the vole population. So foxes eating those voles, um, especially in the winter, they have not been around this year. They've, they've kind of uh, gotten out of there, but there's always one or two resident foxes in those little towns of Cook City and Silvergate that you can find walking around parking lots looking for scraps.
Remember, don't feed the wildlife if you come to Yellowstone. Here is arguably one of the most fun animals to watch and to watch people's reactions to because as you can see in this video, the river otter is so much fun. They slide on their bellies sometimes for much longer. I'm gonna play that back again because it's such a fun video to watch for much longer than a couple feet, but this is a, the only video I could really capture this guy. Back into the water. That's an, a member of the weasel family and an otter. Um, that's gonna be feeding on fish primarily. Although this year we've seen them, and I, granted this might happen all the time, I'm not really sure. Um, we've seen them switching over to ducks. And what'll happen is if there's multiple otters around and one of them gets a duck, they tend to fight over it. So I think they like duck better than they like um, Yellowstone cutthroat trout. <clears throat> this little bird is an American dipper. If you know me, you know I have an obsession with dippers. Um, and for all the images and videos that I've taken of this bird over the last, you know, three years now, I just got this image this winter and I think it's my new favorite as it's surfing down into Soda Butte Creek in the northeast corner of Yellowstone. There's moments before that last image was taken. <clears throat> Another image of this bird. What's cool about dippers is they don't actually migrate south for the winter. Um, they'll do a regional migration of sometimes, you know, even a mile if they have to, not very far at all uh, to find open water. That's what they require because they're eating the same types of things that trout eat. Little nymphs under the surface, um, sometimes little fish and sculpin. Um, yeah, it's a bird that can survive the winter too, which is uh, very interesting. They have a three specific adaptations. Of course, I'm only going to remember two of them. It's a, a really thick coat of feathers and a way slower metabolic rate um, than a lot of other birds. So they don't have to eat as frequently if they can't find that open water. But wherever you find open water in Montana, whether it's the winter or the summer or any shoulder season, really, um, dippers are never going to be far away. Pretty cool. And if you saw Audubon's photo awards last year, um, I placed third in their video category with a, a video of a dipper kind of bobbing in and out of the water in a snowstorm. Gosh, this is a bird that I adore. And on my computer screen, it's about life size. It's a northern pygmy owl. At the most, it thick six or seven inches long from the head to the tail. Very small little owl species, um, primarily active during the day too, which is lovely for viewing opportunities. Although this year, they've been so hard to find. I think I had some 50 or 60 sightings last year in and around the park. Um, but this year, I've only managed to find a couple. And that's not just me. That's the, that's the theme uh, for this winter. I'm not sure why. Probably because there hasn't been a lot of snow to really drive them down. If they can find prey on the tops of mountains, that's what they'll do. Obviously, the great gray owl. <clears throat> One of my favorite birds forever will be one of my favorite birds and one that I spent way too much time with this summer <laughs> filming a, an owl documentary. Um, this bird on the right here is going to be the female from the nest in um, that owl documentary when it comes out. This is a Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep going back into the mammals here. Um, I was just on a hike this afternoon and I saw the largest ram I think I've ever seen in my entire life. And I think this guy was the largest that I had seen before that. Um, but yeah, just an incredible species that we have here. Pretty scarce um, in the bigger, in the overall picture. Uh, so we have fewer than 200 rams in the park. This is an animal that's uh, facing pneumonia it's really taking a toll on their population in, in this specific region. Um, also, I don't, I don't know if it's just this Yellowstone region or the other parts of Montana as well, but there's been a, a, several initiatives to, you know, introduce sheep back into um, historical habitat and kind of revitalize population numbers, mainly so they can be hunted again, because in a lot of places they stopped hunting them so they could recover, but also to just get those populations back where they should be. 
can see a nice chunk taken out of the horn here. So animals with horns, obviously, um, they're going to grow their entire lives. They don't lose them, with one exception to the rule in, in the pronghorn, which we'll see a photo of here in a bit. Um, so when you see a really big ram with a big spread and a full curl, you know that he's going to be pretty old. And a long-lived ram will be about you know 13 years old or so. So this is a really exciting thing. This image and the one after, I haven't actually um, been seen publicly anywhere else, maybe briefly on Instagram, but um, this is a, a mountain lion, obviously, and a female cat at that. She's walking away. So the way I got this image was with a remote camera trap. So we've been doing, my boss, Emil McCain, and I, who is by training a big cat biologist, um, we've been working on this project together to try and photograph mountain lions with this remote camera set up um, in the Gardner Basin. And it's pretty close to the park, but it's not in the park because you are not allowed to do um, any sort of trail camera work or remote camera work in Yellowstone uh, within the border of the park. Um, but when you move out to public land, to national forest land, which is where this camera is, it's, it's fair game. So I want to switch to this next image here. So that's two different mountain lions. Uh, this is a young cat that had come through and gotten pretty curious about the flashes on this ridge that I'm sure they've traveled for you know thousands of years. Um, but when you find a travel corridor, again, in a winter with a lot of snow, you know you can oftentimes have eight to 10 cats using that, that whole area. And this is right in a specific spot where they're kind of on a highway in and out of Yellowstone. But this project has been a lot more hiking and almost falling off of cliffs for myself than it's been photographing mountain lions, which has been a little bit frustrating, but also just the nature of climate change and, and what's happening to the world. Without a lot of snowfall, the cats aren't being forced down to these areas where they're concentrated. But we did get lucky with this young cat. And I, there's a whole series of images here, I think eight altogether. Um, the cat kind of walked by my camera, said what the heck and turned around and, and did get flashed a few times but ended up walking away and off into the night <clears throat> so this is a bull elk rocky mountain elk and if you ask anybody who's lived the majority of their life in montana or wyoming or even idaho utah um, the elk is sort of a, a sacred and, and treasured animal here in the rocky mountains um, not only because of just how incredible they are and how many we have, but they've long been a source of food for people and also for animals. Um, and that's kind of going to segue into my next animal here. If some of you might have guesses as to what that might be. This is a, an image of what an elk herd would look like in the winter time. Not my photo. This is taken from a Washington Post article that I'm also going to touch on here in a little bit. But yeah, a herd animal of course. So I've included this image. Another cool thing I get to do on my job is, you know, find kills and basically experience, you know, um, wildlife and it's, and it's at its finest, really. So what's happened here is this big old mature bull elk was chased into what we call a terrain trap by wolves. So that big antler spread obviously is not easy to get through um, some regenerating lodgepole pine forest. It's a very thick little, little forest in there. So what happened was a pack of wolves ran him down in and then made quick work of him. And that was what the next animal was going to be, our gray wolf. <clears throat> so I have pretty big hands and um, that's obviously a fresh wolf print right next to my hand there. So you can imagine wolves are pretty big. And this is just the beginning of our wolf talk for the evening, but, and I, I would love to hear your guys' questions too after this. So if you have anything you've ever wanted to know about wolves that'll go with this conversation, keep it in mind. Um, so the average size for a wolf in Yellowstone and really anywhere in North America, because we really only have one wolf species besides a couple of subspecies, um, is about a hundred pounds. We do have wolves that have reached, you know, 140 pounds. I think the biggest wolf recorded in Yellowstone was 144, a big male. Um, but on average, for an adult wolf, 100 pounds 
is is what we typically see. There's even wolves running around in the fall that are going to be um, pups of that year, more in the range of you know 70, 70 to seventy five pounds. So they're not these big giant killers like we can we would imagine or or what you know their reputation has often um, chalked them up to be. As you can see here, <laughs> we got we got a whole bunch of wolves in this photo. This is one of my my favorite images from a few winters ago of the eight mile wolf pack here in Yellowstone. Um, this obviously this one one black yearling wolf here is coming back and greeting the rest of the pack. You can see this very submissive pup as well, as well as some of the older wolves. So when you start to see this graying underneath the snout of the black wolves, that's how you can tell that they're going to be an older animal. Um, let's see. Good example here. So yeah. Right now, just like, I'm sorry, just like 100 pounds on the weight, um, the average number for wolves in Yellowstone over the last 27 years of wolf research, because wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone in 1995, um, the average number of individuals in the park has been about 100. And we've had a few more than that in the past, I think at the peak, 140 or 150, sometime, you know, 10 years or so after that wolf reintroduction. Um, but that number has always fallen back to about 100. And that's because even in 2 million acres, um, it's not enough room for many more wolves than that. Wolves are very good at controlling their own populations. They're very territorial. They obviously battle over food sources. Um, and the most common way for a wolf to actually die is by another wolf. They don't like each other unless they're in the same pack. There are some exceptions to that rule too, but typically we say, um, the most common way for a wolf to die in 50% of those wolf mortalities is by other wolves. Um, so I kind of brushed over the wolf reintroduction there. We didn't have wolves from about 1926 to 1995. And that's because in the Rocky Mountains and all places in the lower 48, except for Minnesota, uh, wolves were hunted and eventually poisoned is what did them in. Um, to basically extinction in, in a lot of North America. There were wolves left in Canada. Obviously there's a lot more space up there, but we were lacking in that Rocky Mountain population. Um, and if you look at historical wolf maps, I mean, even in upstate New York, we, a long time ago, you know, a century or two centuries ago now, um, there were wolves running around taking out white-tailed deer. Part of the reason we have so many deer now in a lot of places, Montana included, <clears throat> is that lack of a predator. I should say in towns in Montana because wolves don't really come into towns now. But um, if you look at the Northeast, for example, um, there's, there's really no natural predator for deer. So those populations can explode. So that was the big driving force for bringing wolves back to the Rockies was, oops, we got a, a video of wolves here. There's no audio to this, even though they are howling. You can kind of imagine it. It sounds something like, oh, um, but one of the main driving for, uh, forces for reintroducing wolves was to control the out of control uh, elk herd that had basically just been able to grow without the presence of this, this predator species for the better part of, you know, uh, 75 years or 70 years. So wolves eventually after lots and lots of drama and all sorts of, um, yeah, it, the wolf introduction story was crazy. But 1995, we brought wolves back to the landscape. Uh, since then, they've expanded their populations and they're back to what a lot of states call their recovered phase. Um, in Montana, it's about anywhere from 800 to 1,100 animals, depending on uh, who you ask. There's lots of different predictions on populations out there. Um, this year has been interesting. So. I'm sure some of you have heard in the press that we've had these quote unquote unprecedented wolf killings um, for the first time since that reintroduction. And you might be wondering how are Yellowstone wolves getting killed? Well, going back to um, the whole Northern range and why we call it that is this is some of the best wintering habitat for um, I'll use elk as our, as our main example here. So we have a lot of these prey animals that just move north. We have an elevational migration throughout the year here instead of a latitudinal migration. 
So we have these animals moving north. They eventually get to the lowest parts of the northern range. They keep going and they go right out of the park. And what do the wolves do? The wolves follow that prey source out of Yellowstone onto public lands where they're allowed to be hunted. So once wolves were recovered, quote unquote recovered, their numbers hit their goals, which was 16 breeding pairs at the time of the reintroduction, a little bit of wolf hunting would have been allowed. And I can't remember if it was right away or um, shortly after, but we've, we've had a, a little bit of wolf hunting around the park in the, these two specific wildlife management units, um, 313 and 316, we call this area region three. Um, so every year we've had a, a little bit of wolf hunting and the most wolves that could be killed in region three before this year was two animals. And that was raised from one in a few years ago. Um, but long story short, never more than two animals were allowed to be taken. So this year, those, um, we call them quotas and also thresholds. Um, the Basically the numbers of, of animals that can get killed in a wildlife management unit or a region. Um, the threshold in region three this year was raised to 82. So out of nowhere, um, fully knowing that, you know, our Yellowstone wolves are spending 95% of their lives in Wyoming in the park and only 5% up in Montana for that very small portion in the winter, we were the new governor um, <laughs> against the, the wants of everybody else, essentially said, okay, we're going we're gonna to hunt them. And sure enough, in region three, we went over. So we've had at least 85 individuals taken and about a third of those are gonna be park wolves. So we've lost about 30 of our um, Yellowstone park wolves this winter, which is pretty crazy. So we're actually well below hundred wolves right now in the park, which is interesting. Um, and I'll get back into that a little bit down the uh, presentation here. So this is a, a perfect example, another art, um, I'm sorry, another image taken from that Washington Post article that we have attached into this um, Zoom call. We'll go over that later. Um, this is an image of wolf, of wolf watchers. So since 1995, there have been scopes lined up all over Yellowstone's roads looking for that animal. It is, it is the animal that you come to the park to see. Wolves and grizzly bears and also bison, but for the most part, it's wolves. And that's what all of these folks are out there for. These are, this is the wolf watching community in Yellowstone. Um, so when you start hunting our, our Yellowstone wolves, you know, up in Montana and on their wintering range, and you, and you take about 30 of them away, it has drastic effects on our, our park wolf population. And that's what we've seen this year. Um, this has been one of the first winters really ever since 1995 that you know we, we aren't seeing wolves every day. They've really changed their behavior quite a bit. We've had a, an entire pack get wiped out by hunting. Um, yeah, there's, there's a whole, there's a whole, it, the wolf hunts this year in, in in Montana have been pretty significant and, it, and it's a, a big bummer, but I don't wanna dwell on that too much. We'll keep moving on here. Um, this is the view from Mammoth Hot Springs up in that north entrance road, right in the beginning of the park. So we do get to see some really awesome geothermal stuff throughout the winter. Uh, another image here of a, from Mammoth Hot Springs of a raven in a tree actually, which is cool. Okay, so how are we doing on time here? We're pretty good. So this is pretty uh, online with what's going on these days as our bears are waking up again. So as winter transitions into spring, obviously a lot of things change. Life comes back to the landscape. Um, just give me one sec. We have a very short green period here in Yellowstone. Um, really in this whole Rocky Mountain region. It's, it's, it's really only June and July where, where we have this period of growth and abundance in the form of vegetation, and then things start to turn brown again. So this is another, obviously going back into this Yellowstone map, all of these other park roads open. So we don't just stay up on the Northern Range in the summer, although maybe six days out of 10, I will stay on the Northern Range because it's that great for viewing wildlife. Um, we have this whole entire park to go um, explore. And a lot of our bears, for instance, are gonna be down here for, for close viewing. We do have a good amount of grizzlies up on the Northern range, but um, that particular photo I just showed and also 
This one we're taking down in the interior. So this is a bear that was actually just before hibernation, but we don't have to tell anybody that. We're gonna pretend it's a bear that has just come out of hibernation and there's still a little bit of snow on the ground. That's a young grizzly there. So here's when the landscape begins to transition into green again. Um, obviously we got, actually this bear on top is this bear pictured here. Um, the obsidian sows, cubs. We have a few grizzly bears that spend the majority of their time um, in specific areas of the park year after year. Some of you may know Grizzly 399 down in the Tetons. Um, a good example of uh, a bear we can basically go and view year after year in the same, the same general area. So that was the case with these cubs and they, not long after these photos were taken, got booted out by mom because they were a little over two years old. Um, I, I love to use these images though. So we have these grizzly bears that so many people fear and I'm, I'm partially victim of this as well. It's, a, it's you know, it can be a scary animal to, uh, to come across and, and a bear doesn't want to hurt you, but every once in a while, bears do hurt people. But all they want to do, and just what this cub is doing here is, is, is eat, right? And they don't want to eat flesh. Grizzly bears are eating plants for the majority of their time awake, you know, from basically right now, because we are starting to see a few bears poke their heads out all the way through the fall with a few exceptions where they'll come across a carcass, whether it was winter killed or, um, you know, take advantage of an elk calf or something that they can take down. But what they love to do with those long claws is dig for roots and tubers of various kinds. Um, sometimes they'll dig around and, and catch ground squirrels throughout the spring, especially, but Flowers and, and vegetation and in the late summer, berries are going to be the uh, primary food source for this grizzly bear. There's now a, a pop, well, I shouldn't say now, there's always been this small population. We're just learning more about them now um, in the high mountains of this area. Uh, yep, of this area. Thank you, Kyle. Um, that are uh, eating moths. So there's a moth that basically hatches in the southeastern United States. It migrates all the way across the country to the Rocky Mountains. Where grizzly bears know to go is these high peaks up at you know 10, 11, 12,000 feet, turn over big boulders and scoop sometimes 10,000 moths in a day into their mouths. <clears throat> but not these bears. It's a very specific population um, of grizzlies that's actually doing that. These park bears are a little different. And we do, of course, have black bears here as well. This is the only black bear image that I actually have in this presentation. Oop. Um, this is a cub that I photographed last spring. And it's going to be tough to tell, but there are ants crawling on the snout and the tongue of this bear because it was with its mother and they were running around the open sagebrush, just tearing open ant hills, really to eat the larvae. But of course, they get a couple of ants on their faces, um, sort of as a collateral of that event. A little bit back into the birds here. Got the harlequin duck, um, a duck that I know migrates through New York to its breeding grounds in the higher latitudes. We do have them breeding here in Yellowstone, which is a treat. Two males there sitting on a rock. Obviously another great gray owl image. Um, one of my favorite great gray images um, that I was able to capture this spring on a day that I didn't think I was going to see anything. I was very bummed leaving the woods and then sure enough this bird surprised me very cool a good raptor for us here that's a young peregrine falcon peregrines love these big tall canyon walls that we have here in yellowstone <clears throat> this particular bird is in the gardner canyon pretty cool and i mentioned earlier the pronghorn antelope this is the fastest land animal that we have in north america even those little calves there are capable of running faster than any predator animal, predator species um, in the park at only a couple days old. Um, they're pretty much unable to be caught by anything except for the odd chance that they might trip and fall, which is never fun to watch. But funny story about this photo. I took this on my first ever trip to Yellowstone. I was a college student and took a road trip with my roommate at the time and took this photo, processed it, deleted the raw image because I never thought anything of it. And I don't think ever again will I be able to recreate something like this because now spending, you know, better part of three years in the park, I've never 
never again seen a scene like this. Very cool. Again, we talked about the season of abundance, right? So I oftentimes get clients asking me, you know, like, why, are, how come all that animals are doing out here is eating? Well, it's because there's really only two months of the prime vegetation. Then they have to start switching over to other things. So um, if you look at the healthiest time of a year of the year for something like a, a bison or an elk, or even this little rabbit, a pika, um, it's going to be in the summer when they're getting the best, the greenest, most nutritious vegetation. So a pika um, doesn't go into hibernation, but spends the winter underneath the rocks eating everything that it's gathered throughout those warmer months. And they'll do this pretty much from the time that they become active right about now um, above ground. And they'll pretty much, you know, stash vegetation in little, what we call hay piles throughout the year. And then, you know, feed on those throughout the winter. So a lovely little photo here from the Beartooth Pass, which is a beautiful. Now we got some elk in the yard too. This is, this is awesome. This is Gardner, Montana for you guys. <clears throat> Beartooth Pass is the North. Basically you leave the Northeast part of the park. They call it the most beautiful highway in America. Another image from there. Um, it takes you up at basically 11,000 feet to the, to the high mountains above tree line, but um, still filled with wildlife. Obviously this little pika is why I go up there. <clears throat> and this is sort of typical pika habitat. As you can see, my friend and, and mine backpacks, tripod gear scattered all over the place. And where's the pika sitting right behind the gear. So obviously I had walked away looking for the pika and it ran around me through the scree slope here and was then hanging out with my bag. <laughs> pretty cool. This is an animal that's um, pretty threatened by climate change. So they need, they need cool temperatures um, to survive. Obviously they get those on mountaintops, but as it gets warmer and warmer, the level and the elevation at which these critters can exist is just raising slowly and slowly every single year. Um, and eventually, you know, they won't be able to get to elevations high enough that are suitable for them to live in. Back into our wolf images here. This is a, a yearling black wolf. Um, took this image last May with my parents in town. Their first wolf encounter was a wolf at 70 yards walking along a log and feeding on a bison. Doesn't happen to everybody, but it was pretty, pretty special that day. Here's an image from later that summer as it got a little warmer, a little greener. These two yearlings were also feeding on a different bison. Um, stop to take a photo here. Good example of some of those flowers that grow up, the goldenrod that um, we're used to seeing back in the Northeast as well. This wolf is actually collared and actually the, the black wolf I showed in the winter image was collared as well. I didn't really touch on that, but about half of our wolves in the park are collared um, with various types of collars, whether it's a GPS collar or a VHF collar, which is the high frequency radio. Um, they both give slightly different pieces of information. One is far more reliable than the other, and that is the VHF. Uh, this wolf has a collar. You can kind of see the box there. Uh, her number is going to be 1228. So when wolves are collared, there's the good image of the, of the box underneath her jaw there. Uh, when wolves are collared, they have blood drawn and they are assigned a number. So every wolf that has a collar is numbered. Um, and again, going back to that theme of being able to watch the same animals year after year, 1228 is a wolf that we have all had the pleasure of watching for the last three years now. She's finally broken off from the pack that she's been part of and is starting her own pack in a different part of the park, which we're crossing our fingers for her. Um, this was an image I took last June. She basically picked up this bison femur in the middle of Lamar, Lamar Valley, and she carried it eight miles back to the, to the wolf den where there were eight puppies or yeah, eight puppies waiting to play with it. Um, a good example at you know how social these wolves can really be and they're just like our dogs at home which if there's no other reason for for hunting wolves it, it just you got to wonder how how people want to hunt these wolves that are our dogs <laughs> which is, is yeah again um 
we're going to talk more about wolves in a second here, but that's been at the forefront of all of our minds this, this whole entire year. And a good little send off from the, the summer stuff here is two bull bison. Um, in August, we get the bison rut happening. You know, the males get to clash with one another and battle for breeding rights. Here's a, another photo of me and some clients that I decided to add. Um, you can see this line of cars behind us and this stack of people right here looking down and across at the Junction Butte Wolf Pack across the way there. We had hiked up to get a better view. So moving into the themes of what we talked about in the program description here. So how do you love something but not love it to death? Again, uh, this, this human animal coexistence thing goes one way for a little period of time then it comes back the other way um, in a cycle it seems. So this is a, an image that I've always wanted to use for something like this. This is a, a Rocky Mountain Bighorn sheep, obviously, in the middle of racing traffic, driving, driving by at 60 miles an hour. Um, so with COVID, obviously, uh, international travel was severely limited. Um, domestic travel kicked way up and our national parks have had the most visitation in sometimes 30% single year increases that you know, they've ever seen. <clears throat> Here's a really good example. The town of Gardner, where I'm situated right now, has a yearly or year round um, population of 900 people. If 4.6 million people are coming to the park, <laughs> like you can best believe a few of them are going to be coming through Gardner. It's one of the main entrances. There's really two main entrances that people use. Um, there are four, but two very popular ones. One's in West Yellowstone, Montana, and then the other here in Gardner. So this says, a million people came through Gardner last year. That's a lot of people. So how do we, and again, there's no simple answer for this, um, but how do we, you know, kind of find a, strike a balance between, you know, increased visitation and also be sharing, being sure that we uh, protect our resources. <clears throat> so that's just what the theme with, you know, uh, the park itself is. So I have a couple images here that are going to kind of go into human predator coexistence. So that's mainly for the folks that are living here, but also, yes, you know, when you, when you start throwing all this added visitation and growing these little towns um, significantly for a small portion of the year, you know, obviously it's having a, a small effect on our local wildlife. So the big reason for uh, wanting to hunt things like wolves, and now they're slowly trying to hunt grizzlies again is to kind of, um, you know, try and find that balance between humans and predators. You know, obviously, if we went back to historic levels of wolves in North America running around, um, and the same with bears, it would probably just be a little crazy. <laughs> um, but what's happening now is we've developed so many areas and we've kind of shrunk our wildlife onto these little plots of undeveloped land and wilderness, places like Yellowstone, like the Beartooth of Zorka wilderness, just beyond Yellowstone. Um, and other parts of the country too. So their populations can't be that high. And the theme that we're kind of seeing, unfortunately with the world these days is, you know, we're gonna let our wildlife be wild to a degree. And once they start crossing that line, you know, they need to be hunted. And I'm not advocating against wolf hunting entirely. Um, I probably would advocate right now against grizzly bear hunting entirely, which is something that they're, these folks are trying to, you know, reintroduce, but there are going to be situations where wolves push the boundaries and, and they get into livestock and they come too close to town and they are sick and they're not, you know, um, they're not acting like wolves should act. And in those instances, and part of the theme of the reintroduction was, you know, you, you, yes, you do hunt these animals if they cross that line. So um, what's cool about the, sort of the rules that came along with that wolf reintroduction was, you know, if an animal is, or if livestock is killed by a wild animal, the rancher is reimbursed uh, the full market price of that cow, that sheep, whatever it may be. Obviously, you know, getting paid out for losing a cow isn't the same equation. You're still losing something. Um, but it's not like wolves were set on the landscape. Um, to just run through livestock and we weren't going to do anything about it. But we have 
this new age of ranchers around the Gardner Basin in particular here, just north of Yellowstone, that are encouraging this human predator coexistence. So we take clients to a spot right here called Tom Miner Basin, about 10, 15 miles out of town, where there's a lot of cattle. And at the same time, there are also a lot of grizzly bears. They're eating this uh, root called caraway. And oftentimes we're watching bears and cows in the same fields and nothing's happening. Actually, I've seen a cow chase a grizzly bear. So the story that you'll often hear is, hey, um, you know, bears and wolves and mountain lions, you know, they're killing livestock, but that's really just not the reality of the situation. If you want to look at what's killing livestock, you need to look at things like winter storms, because that's what's going to be taking uh, the biggest toll on these, these cattle herds. <clears throat> so just around the corner here from my little window is this garage door. And just up to the left is this photo that I took uh, this fall. We, we live with wildlife here in Gardner. This is, these are grizzly bear prints on the garage and also in the snow and the ice. Um, it's just part of living here. You can talk to locals who have spent every bit of their lives in this town and it's always been, you know what? Yeah, we know, you know, you can't leave your trash out in Gardner because there are grizzly bears around in the fall. If you have an apple tree in your yard, maybe you don't go outside it you know, three or four in the morning when the grizzly bear is going to be eating it. <laughs> That's what kind of what happened here is we had bears coming down this little trail creek and right into our yard um, every single night and leaving their tracks behind and getting curious and maybe smelling the elk that we had hanging in the garage. <laughs> but we try and mitigate and, and limit those, those encounters to just, okay, the bears come in at night and they leave in the morning. Um, obviously you don't want a grizzly to be pressing on your garage door, but that's why we locked it and we made sure to get rid of all those scents right after we found those tracks. It's part of living with the wildlife. <clears throat> Photo of my clients here out on uh, the blacktail plateau. So to circle back in a wolf and predator hunting for the third time, um, we need to start looking at the what I think and, and what a lot of folks think and part of the argument for stopping wolf hunting entirely right now is the economic incentives. So on the low end of things, wolf viewing alone is 30, a $30 million um, per year industry. And this says up to $60 million, which is incredible because to hunt a wolf in Montana, you have to buy a wolf tag that costs uh, 10 or $12. And with that 10 or $12 wolf tag, you can hunt 10 wolves. So obviously if two or 300 wolves are killed a year, we're not getting $30 million from wolf hunting. But like I mentioned earlier, um, once you start affecting these wolf populations in the park, you're sort of playing with that $30 million industry. Cause now we have clients calling us up in advance saying, are we gonna see wolves? Um, because we're hearing that a lot of the wolves are being hunted and we really want to see wolves, but if it's not a guarantee, we're not going to come. Whereas that wouldn't have, wouldn't have ever happened, you know, in the last decade before this year. So it's been really interesting. <clears throat> I'm sure we can get back into this in the questions too, but I just wanted to end on this photo again. Um, it's a good, a good wrap up for that theme of human predator coexistence, right? We're walking alongside, aside these incredible animals. We have, you know, wolves and grizzly bears and bison are the big three that represent a wild place. And that's kind of what we have in Montana here. And really it's what we should have in the whole heart of the Rocky Mountains. But what we don't want to see is um, the movement away, right? We don't, we don't want to get rid of these animals that make these places so special. And by hunting our wolves, you know, by trying to take out our grizzly bears, by wanting to cull our bison and not let them winter outside of the park, um, we're slowly but surely chipping away at the, the wildness that you find here in Montana and Wyoming and Idaho. Um, and that's why it's so critical being a guide in the park to tell these stories to people and bring them to this place and show them why we want the, these wildlife here and maybe how to coexist with them. Um, and I hope <laughs> I was able to kind of articulate that well enough for everybody here. Um, but yeah, if we could dive into some questions you guys might have. Um, That'd be great. Thank you. You got a little, there we do. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, before we start transitioning people over into uh, the panelist group, I do want to share a couple of things in the chat window. And one of them is a Washington Post article from March 4th on uh, Yellowstone wolves and hunting. So if anybody's interested in taking a look at that. And I also want to share when, when Kyle was talking about the dipper being one of his favorite birds, um, I have to say that I'm going to link you to the video page on his website, which has two of the most extraordinarily beautiful little short videos of the dipper kind of in that natural habitat. And I encourage you all after the program to make sure you save that link and um, go check out that video because it really is breathtaking and beautiful. So we're gonna move people over into the panelist area. Um, Ramona, I'm gonna bring you over first because you have your hand up for a question, um, but I'm gonna go through the list and bring everybody over so that um, people can see each other. And it will take me a little bit of time to do this. So bear with me as we shift. Um, and Charlie, or um, Becky, if you guys can work, uh, maybe Charlie, if you can go from the top down and I'll go from the bottom up um, in the more tab and then just select promote to panelist, we'll get everybody over a little bit more quickly. Thanks to everybody who tuned in. So Ramona, you had a question. You can feel free to unmute your microphone and go ahead and ask. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, my question is, I mean, I sign all the different petitions that are out. Uh, what more can we be doing to help the wolves? I, I write letters to the different congressmen. Um, yeah. You know, it's- yeah, thank you. Uh, go ahead. Oh no! I was, I was, I, that's exactly what we we need folks to be doing is is making our their voices heard. You know, even if you're not, you know, right here, um, sort of in the forefront of this this war on on wolves and predators, writing those letters goes a really really long way. Um, talking to your representatives, um, yeah. I, right now, that's that's unfortunately the nature of this whole thing. It's it's pretty political. Um, the most important thing though is by you know reaching out and, and writing letters and signing all those online annoying things that come in emails from all the conservation groups i'm sure that you folks are associated with it you know it's basically just got this big pool of momentum like going uh in the direction of trying to get these things stopped and obviously the entire you know world right now really has their eye on this this whole yellowstone wolf thing um so we're basically at this point, just kind of waiting, waiting to see what happens. But yeah, don't don't stop. <laughs> this is my best advice to you. And thank you. Okay. For is there anybody else that has a question that would like to uh, speak? Looks like Catherine might have a question there. Hi, Kyle. Hey. Um, you know, um, if I was thinking of taking a trip to Yellowstone, um, well, I guess there's a two part question. What do you think is the best time of year for me to come? I'm retired, I have a flexible schedule, so I'm not forced to come in the summer. My, my suspicion is that summer is very busy and I would tend to maybe then try to pick either spring or fall, but are those good times to come? What, what do you suggest? Yeah, so I tell people every day, my favorite time of year is gonna be the last two weeks of May to the first two weeks of June. So you beat the crowds obviously, um, but you also get sort of like the best abundance of wildlife, I think. So 
there's this this really cool theme that we call riding the green wave in Yellowstone. So when it gets warm, the lowest elevations, the warmest places are going to grow that vegetation first, right? So it turns green in the valley floors, and then slowly that wave kind of moves up to the higher mountains. So what that means is when your grizzly bears, for instance, are waking up in you know April and May, they're down in the valleys with us. It's incredible. I could show you a grizzly bear seven months out of the year, but you know, all but that last two weeks of May to first two weeks of June, those bears are going to be way high on ridges and we'll be watching the spotting scopes. But when you come in the spring, um, you're really just like immersed with, with those animals down low. The wolves are getting that time of year. Um, so it's really exciting to maybe get the chance to see a wolf puppy poking its head out of a den for the first time or something like that. So that's, that's my favorite time in the park and why I'm really excited that it's, you know, right around the corner here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Dave would like to know, is there a season when you see the pygmy owls or is it all year round? It's man. A lot of people will tell you winter is the best time to see them. Um, I'm not like a lot of people though, because I like to challenge myself and go out and not find things all the time. They breed here. They're here year round. Um, but in the winter time, especially when it snows, food availability is a little bit more scarce. That's when you're going to get them out uh, hunting for more out in the day and, you know, perching out in the open along. A lot of times they're along roads where it's more open for them to see. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit of both, but they are here year round. Um, if you find a nest, that's, you know, the best time to see them, obviously, because you can kind of concentrate your area or your efforts in that area. But good question. Thank you. Kyle. Hi. Hi. Um, this is Janet Potter. Hi. How are you? Um, good. Beautiful, beautiful photographs. I'm wondering about the company that you work for. Can you tell us a little bit about the company and what you do? Yeah. So I work for Yellowstone Wild out of Gardner, Montana. Um, and basically we're all, everybody, you know, I'm, let's, let's put it this way. We're all very well trained. A lot of people, um, I think between all of us, we have over a century's worth of years of experience in Yellowstone as naturalist interpretive guides. I've been doing it for a year, so I guess still got a little ways to go. Um, but yeah, so that's our goal is to not only take people out to see things, but to actually teach you about them. Um, and that's a fun thing for me because Yellowstone and the folks I work with are still teaching me a lot. So I'm kind of able to take this information learn it really fast and then spin it around and teach you guys or whoever my clients are um, those days. Yeah, but we were started by Emil McCain. He's a wildlife biologist who spent the majority of his career, um, early career in places like South America trapping jaguars and then moving into Yellowstone and working with cougars and, and uh, big cats. So we, we come from that, um, that science background and we try and in the best way possible, translate that into a, a, a tour in Yellowstone. Thank you. So I think I got most people over into panelists, but we still have some in the attendees group. If, if anyone didn't get over and they want to come on and ask a question, um, just use the raise hand function and I'll make sure we pull you over. Dave is raising his hand, or both of you guys. <laughs> okay. So we can't hear you. So you got to unmute your microphone there. In the bottom left, it should be. There bottom you left. How's there? there you go. Perfect. We you got you yes. Okay. Yeah, we're, uh, we're Yellowstone veterans. I mean, I've been going out essentially every year since the early 1980s, and we spend our whole summer out there. So we, we spent a great deal of time there. Um, but anyway, there, there's wolf packs, obviously, that aren't all on the northern range. Um, you know, yep. there's wolf packs over in the Gallatins, there's wolf packs in Hayden, there's wolf packs further south. Do you know, has there been an issue also with Wyoming and I suppose also Idaho in terms of their hunts of, uh, you know, the numbers of wolves they've killed there? Or is it primarily a Montana problem? The focus for the Yellowstone wolf population has been the Montana problem. 
Because okay. if you look at wolf distribution in the park, the majority of the wolves are going to be pretty much, you know, the northern range and also right. maybe the that northern half of the park, right? So they're following the northern elk herd, which is just going north. So even even you know the Wapiti Lake Pack, who breeds down in in or I'm sorry, dens down in Hayden Valley, like that's their core territory. They spend a lot of their time up north in the winter. It's kind of mm-hmm. cool, and you know, we'll we'll hear snow coaches that see them down in in Canyon, you know, the afternoon of say today, and then tomorrow morning they're up on the northern range. So like all night they just ran the roads up to the to elk creek or wherever it might be following those elk herds but it, the focus has been so strong on the wolf hunting here around gardner that i personally have kind of lost track um, of what's been hunted down in wyoming i know they did have some wolves get shot in the tetons that i think what they end up doing is they go east from grand teton on public land out that way and get and get shot um idaho they they just love killing wolves in that state and it's not you know, really yellowstone wolves it's a lot of the wolves that are up in the panhandle mm-hmm. um but we did just from personal experience i was following a pack outside of the park two two summers ago um that eventually got into idaho and, and got killed and they were actually old um the old cougar creek pair is what they refer oh, to them as yeah. yeah so they they came out of that cougar creek area in the southwest part of the park Right. went up into west yellowstone they had a den they had puppies and then that that fall i think that whole pack was just kind of eliminated but yeah there's there is good information on um the wolf hunting as a whole and that that washington post article will be a good uh, reference but the majority of the wolves this year park wolves that have been shot have been in region three um north of gardner or right in gardner here really um another quick thing on that it's, it's kind of unfair to hunt these wolves that come out of Yellowstone. And to be honest, I think there needs to be a buffer for, for wolf hunting around the park and a large buffer at that, because these wolves are seeing people every single day, you know, um, they're not necessarily afraid of people, the wolf hunting in other parts of the state and other States as a whole, it's not as easy as it is right here because, you know, people have learned and these, the wolf hunting community has learned that, Hey, if you just set up north of Yellowstone in the winter and you wait, like these packs are coming right out and it's, it's predictable. They do it every year. Um, and it's, it's unfair to those animals. I think there, I think there really needs to be a, a significant buffer and we might get that, um, with this latest reviewing on the endangered species list again, or endangered species act. <clears throat> so it'll be interesting. Are you guys coming out this summer? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I muted uh, us. yeah, we are. We're we're not going to be out until August this year, so we're going to be out in August and September. But cool, uh, we have some other commitments. But. Very cool. Maybe reach out and we'll we'll see you in the park. I I am well, definitely we're, going to. <laughs> we're there <Right>. all the <laughs> time. Cool. Um, um. Oh, go ahead, Becky. Denise would like to know how do you prepare for animal encounters counters that are aggressive unusual or possibly dangerous, especially when you have clients with you? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the best way to prepare is, you know, to really just expect the unexpected, but we have ways to mitigate things like bear attacks by, you know, using bear spray, by hiking in groups, by making noise. Um, which was always an interesting concept for me coming out, trying to be quiet to look at all the birds in the woods and not scare them away. Now you got to make as much noise as possible when you're especially hiking alone to make the bears and the other animals aware of you. Um, I think statistically the most dangerous animal in Yellowstone is a ground squirrel. Um, But, (laughs) you know, there are every once in a while a bear attack or, or two and some fate also not, but the best thing you can do is carry bear spray and hike with your friends if you're going to plan to do some hiking. And if you're backpacking or camping, making sure your food storage is um, proper. We have, you know, 50 or more years of good, you know, bear attack mitigation science, you could say. Um, so there, there are ways to prevent those sorts of things. Well, 
I think we're at about our time uh, to end for this evening. Um, we do have one final question from Abby. Is there a better winter month to plan a guide trip? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Winter is pretty much, you know, any of the winter months you can expect the same thing. I think if you pick the snowiest month, that might be a good bet for seeing unique things like, you know, um, for one, as, as a photographer, animals in the snow is like one of the coolest things and seeing how they adapt. So um, you say February, if, if I had to, <laughs> I booked a couple of photo tours and multi-day trips this year with clients that we had been talking in the in, previously and February was the month that we settled on. But, you know, if you looked at the, the most incredible wolf encounters that happened this year with some of my colleagues, it was in, it was in March and January. So um, I think winter is winter and um, yeah, no is the answer. The short answer to that question. <laughs> well, as always, we really appreciate you sharing your photos and your passion for your topics. Um, you just make everybody proud and we thank you very much for, for coming out and joining us tonight. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. And you have accolades and some thank yous coming in on chat. Um, Tom yeah. Salo basically said he didn't have camera and mic hooked up, but wanted to thank you for your excellent presentation, great information, and all your efforts to educate the public. So awesome. I think we can all echo that. I can't wait to look back in 10 years and see um, how far I've come in just being able to talk. <laughs> I have so many thoughts in my head and I'm just still like all over the place sometimes, but. Um, you have to write it. I know. Well, I'll tell you what, it's a lot easier when you're on tour and it's like, these things are just coming to you throughout the day, you know, whether it's like actually viewing the animals versus looking at a Zoom screen and trying to remember everything that you know. So thank yeah. you for bearing with me. No, excellent job. Thank you. All right, everybody, we hope to see you uh, next month for Landscaping with Native Plants. Thank you all for coming out tonight and enjoy this warm weather. Let's hope it lasts at least a little while. I, I know it you know, doesn't really get warm until maybe May or June, but let's, let's hope. <laughs> all right, good night, everybody.